Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first of this year's lectures in the Gold and the Good series, organized by the Cathedral and the Department of Philosophy. My name is Henk de Berg. I'm a professor in the School of Languages and Cultures and one of the two directors, together with Evgeny Dubrenko of the Prokhorov Center, which sponsors this lecture series together with the university's Global Humanities Initiative. Our speaker this evening is John Gray, author of the book Seven Types of Atheism. As usual, we will have the lecture first, and then there will be a question and answer session. That session will be led by my colleague Bob Stern, professor in the Department of Philosophy. After that, there will be a short book signing event at the bookstore over there, where you will be able to buy some of John Gray's books. Now, I have to tell you, when Bob Stern told me, emailed me, that he had managed to get John Gray for this lecture series, I was immediately very enthusiastic because I'd always wanted, I'd always wanted to read John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. <laughs> what is more, I knew that in the Jessup West building in which I work on the fourth floor and where on the ground floor there were always some free books lying around, I knew I'd seen a copy there of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. So upon receiving Bob's email, I immediately rushed down to get that copy. It was still there. With the book securely in my possession, I then returned to my office and decided to find out a little bit more about John Gray. So I Googled him, as one does, and there he was, complete with photograph. John Gray, American writer, author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. However, below that, there was a photograph of another man with the text, John Gray, British philosopher, author of Seven Types of Atheism, and I realized I'd got the book by the wrong John Gray. Oops. So I ended up reading both books, and uh, having done that, I am pleased to say that we got the British John Gray, that John Gray, the British John Gray, in addition to writing books, writes for The Guardian, uh, The Times Literary Supplement, and uh, The New Statesman. He's a regular guest on radio and television, and was one of the main interviewees for the television documentary, Marx Reloaded. This is the one. Uh, together with uh, the other interviewees, Jacques Rancière, Peter Sloterdijk, and uh, Slavoj Žižek. The title of the book Seven Types of Atheism is an allusion to the book Seven Types of Ambiguity by the literary critic William Empson, who until his retirement in 1972 was professor of English at the University of Sheffield. Empson tried to show how ambiguity in literature is not a bad thing, but allows us to see the complexity of the world. I think John tries to do the same when analyzing types of atheism. Hence, in case you're wondering, I don't think there's anything strange about someone talking about atheism here in the cathedral, in the church. After all, many atheists may wonder how on earth someone can believe in God, but many believers wonder how in heaven's name someone can not believe in God. There is then a need for better understanding on both sides. So to start off that dialogue, please welcome the British philosopher, John Gray. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, I wouldn't call this a lecture. I would call it a series of thoughts I'll put before you, which I hope will stimulate your thinking on religion and atheism. I'm not intending to convert any of you from or to anything, but simply to ask some questions and perhaps some of you will think of these issues in a slightly different way as a result of that. I was about to say I didn't uh, know uh, um, uh, Henk had uh, misidentified me as the other John Gray, but he's not the only person to have done so. Um, I was told a few years ago that a well-known person had walked into a bookshop at Piccadilly Circus and asked for John Gray's book. They gave him the Man and Venus book. He walked out and was later heard to have said that wasn't very interesting. The person was David Bowie. One of my great 
life influences, by the way. Um, so it has happened. Um, it doesn't really matter much. What am I going to talk about tonight? Well, I want to ask the question and actually show how difficult it is to answer the question. What are atheist values? What values do atheists have? And where do these values come from? Now, I'll be upfront with you, and it's a sign, I think, as Henke said, of the tolerance and freedom of thought that goes on in many churches today, which is I am myself an atheist. So I speak as an atheist, not as a Christian, not even as a Christian camp follower or a hidden or closet theist, but an atheist, not an agnostic. And um, perhaps I should say what I mean by that when I say that I'm an atheist. What I mean by that is an atheist to me is someone who either rejects or just doesn't need or use the idea of a creator God, a divine mind that fashioned this world and human beings in it. So you're an atheist in my way of thinking if you either reject that idea or just don't have it. Now that I think you'll see is quite, although it's a very basic sort of minimalist type definition or formula, it has some consequences which maybe are not so obvious, which is that if you understand atheism in this way, one thing that will follow is that there are atheist religions. Because there are religions in the world, old religions, uh, religions which have had millions and hundreds of millions and still do have hundreds of millions of followers, in which there isn't anything like a creator god that fashioned this world. Most kinds of Buddhism, for example, reject the idea of a creator god and even the idea of an individual soul. They explicitly reject it. So theism, if you like, which is the belief or the assertion that there is a, a divine mind that created this world and God in it and human beings in it, and furthermore, in many accounts, is the source of what's valuable in the world, underwrites the goodness in the world. Atheism, uh, theism and religion aren't the same. You can be uh, religious without being a theist, and hundreds of millions of Buddhists or Taoists or Confucians or Shintoists and many others, animists, who believe that the world is full of hundreds of mini-gods, but that there is no creator god, they would all be in this minimalist understanding, atheists, but they'd also be practicing their different religions. And equally, and I'll come to this later, uh, there can be, when a, a certain type of atheism, a range of types of atheism that have uh, developed in Europe and in the West and other parts of the world over the last few hundred years, there can be types of atheism which are very like monotheism, which even reproduce many of the ways of thinking of monotheism while rejecting its, some of its beliefs, that are themselves religions. Religions in the sense that they have many of the same kind of practices, dogmas, heresies and heretics. Uh, they satisfy the same psychological needs and they have many of the same essential messages but leave out uh, uh, or attempt to leave out uh, a creator God. So um, that's what I, uh, how I think of myself. I think of myself as an atheist in the sense that I, I don't have that idea. I also think that, uh, that this is a slightly different question. I also think that this life is all that I can be sure of and that when I die, that's it, I'm gone. Uh, nothing left, the story's over. And that may be important because I think one of the roots of religion in both its theistic and other forms is the shock of mortality. How do we differ from the other animals? Uh, I accept broadly the Darwinian theory as the best approximation of the truth, which is that we are animals, not like animals, we are animals. Our minds are animal minds. They've evolved in the way that other mind, animal minds have evolved. Um, uh, uh, but how do we differ from other animals? Some people say we make tools, we have languages, uh, we reflect upon ourselves. I think the main difference, or the one which has very profound and far-reaching effects, is that unlike the other animals, we know that our lives are finite. It may be that elephants and some other animals have a kind of instinctive response to the death of their kin of other elements, but it looks as if we are the only animal, as far as we can tell, which has a definite 
clear understanding, not of what death is, because actually none of us knows. I simply act on the assumption that it's the end for me. I don't actually know. But we have the definite understanding that our lives are limited and finite and are going to come to an end. And that, I think, changes everything for us because it means that, unlike the other animals, I think we're inclined, constitutively, you might say, by being human, to try and construct our lives in the form of a coherent story. Uh, because we know it's going to end. We, we, we have a deep-seated need to find a meaning in our lives, both individually and collectively, as a coherent story, which in some sense diminishes the shock of death. And um, other animals aren't like this. Um, I may entertain or surprise or amuse you by telling you that my next book is about cats. Uh, cats and the meaning of life. I've lived with cats, cherished cats. My wife and I have had cats for many years. Our cat at the moment is 22 years old, so it's quite a long-lived cat. And I've never seen my cat meditating on the imminence of death. I've never seen it either, or I guess that turning its life into a story. Some people say that cats have no sense of time. They live in a perpetual now. That's not true. He wakes us both up every morning about half past four when he wants his breakfast, so he has a very clear idea of when his breakfast is due and a clear idea of the passage of time. But most animals don't tell their lives as sto uh, stories. Humans do. The bleak birth, copulation, death, T.S. Eliot, is too little for human beings to tolerate, especially since any story that they might be able to contrive around that, those bare facts, can be disrupted if not by their own death, then by the death of their loved ones. If not by the death of a loved human being, by the death of a whole city, or a whole country, or a whole way of life, which has actually happened many times in the 20th century and is happening actually today. So with those threats to meaning around <coughs> us and with the idea, perhaps not the idea, but the sense of our mortality pressing on us, human beings turn to religion. That's one of the um, reasons they do. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about basically two things. The first is the variety of atheist values. The variety of atheist values. And here I'm putting on my hat as a historian of ideas and I want to communicate something of the diversity of values that different atheists at different times have actually held. And they're not just diverse values. In many cases they're opposed values. Why do I think it's important to understand that? Well, nearly all atheists today, most at any rate, are liberals, what might be called liberal humanists. That's to say they believe in human rights, human freedom, individuality, the need to be fair, uh, they oppose discrimination and exclusion. Um, uh, they, uh, and they often think there's some essential connection between their atheism and these liberal values. But historically speaking, most atheists have not been liberals, and, and even now atheists have a whole different variety of uh, conceptions of the good, what a good society would be like or what a good human being would be like. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, uh, uh, the variety of atheist values. And the second thing I want to talk about is morality itself. We all think we know what we mean by morality, but do we? What, you see, what, is, what is this special area of life, supposedly more important than any other, that we call morality? I mean, we think of morality as being some kind of set of values that have a, uh, they're overriding. They override other values like self-interest or maybe even aesthetics, beauty, profit, uh, whatever. And they're universal. We think that um, most atheists think that these values apply to and have authority over all human beings. But if you abandon uh, athe if you abandon theism, if you really get rid of theism, if you really leave it behind, does the idea of morality that we have survive? Is the idea of morality that I've just described as a kind of an overriding area of human value which is more important than any of the others and which is somehow universal in its demands. Does that really survive? Or do we really have to think quite differently about the good life 
and how to live, and maybe adopt other traditions of thinking about it, like, for example, I'll come back to that later, a Greek tradition in which ethics is it held to include not just what we think of as right and wrong behavior, but even things like hygiene, uh, things like beauty. Ethics for the ancient Greeks was really the whole art of life, how to live well. Um, and there wasn't a kind of assumption either that the answers that would be given to how to live well would be the same for everybody. They might be, they might be different for different people. In that sense, it wouldn't, might not be universal. So we might have to start thinking not just about different moralities, but really about what morality itself is. Let me look at briefly at some of the uh, 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 atheist moralities that have developed in Western countries uh, over the last um, couple of hundred years ago. Well, one that I like to study, by the way, I, I hope some of you who take these issues extremely seriously won't be offended by this, but I often find passages of great comedy in these deep, deep issues, deep issues. One thing I'm quite interested in is Auguste Comte, the 19th century French philosopher and sociologist. He invented the word sociology and the first sociology. Any of you heard of him, Auguste Comte? And he was an interesting fellow. Um, he wasn't altogether sane. Uh, um, he um, sometimes signed himself Bonaparte, that gives you a clue. Um, he uh, founded a, um, a religion, he called it the religion of humanity, which um, had a pope, that was him. Uh, it, had, it was immensely successful, you'd think it wouldn't have been, it was, it was very successful, spread many parts of the world, spread to Vietnam, Brazil, L uh, London, Britain, Liverpool, had churches, had a huge influence on numerous people. John Stuart Mill, the great liberal political theorist and moral philosopher. George Eliot, the famous uh, novelist, were among them. The um, uh, engineers who built the Panama Canal were disciples of Comte. It was huge, absolutely huge. Almost forgotten now, um, but very, very important. Now, the religion that he invented, he called the religion of humanity. And he thought the core of this religion was altruism. That's to say, sympathy for others. He invented the word altruism. It was he who first coined it. So he thought that um, instead of having a transcendental object of worship, God, who created mankind and the world, what human beings should do is instead uh, have an ideal conception of humanity. And he said, in future, the supreme being would be humanity quite explicit about this, the Supreme Being. And he imagined a church with uh, uh, priests, uh, model on the Catholic Church, and rituals. The rituals have a certain flavor today. One of the rituals he favored and instructed his followers copy, co uh, follow and adopt was uh, one in which uh, he was, I should mention, he was a phrenologist. You know what that means? He believed that the emotions and movements of the human heart and soul were determined by, or could be gauged by bumps on the head. So what he advised that they do every day, he was also a numerologist, is that they touch the bumps on their head on the, uh, where the impulses for benevolence and altruism were placed. And if they did that regularly several times a day, they would become more benevolent and more, and, and more, and more generous. He also invented a type of clothing, positivist clothing, with the buttons up the back. And the reason for this was if people couldn't put their own clothes on by themselves or take them off by themselves, they would be more altruistic, he reasoned. Uh, really true. But he was a profound thinker in one sense, maybe more than one sense. He assumed that human beings in the future, as in the past, would need a religion. He was not one of those atheists who thought that religion would die out as a pre-scientific form of thinking. He did think that the coming age would be purely scientific. But for that reason, what was needed was a religion based on science and um, uh, compatible with science and based on science. And this was the religion of humanity. Now, interestingly for us today, uh, he had a huge influence, but he was not what we would now call a liberal. He hated liberalism. He hated individualism. He said that what he wanted was uh, a world to recreate a kind of society like the Middle Ages, but without God and without, without Christianity with a different religion. It would be hierarchical, 
There'd be experts at the top. He said the experts at the top would answer all the ethical questions. He'd say, should I marry so-and-so? You just put something in the post and with the details, you'd eventually get an answer. That's not really caricaturing it. He thought that what could be uh, that moral knowledge could be turned into a science, that there could be a science of ethics. Many people today still think this. Um, Sam Harris, the American new atheist, thinks exactly this, though I don't think he's ever read uh, uh, Comte. Um, he was against individualism, and in fact, one of the influences of his thought, he had a great impact on interesting people and admirable people like John Stuart Mill and George Eliot, but he also had an impact in France and elsewhere on later fascist thinkers. The founder of the French fascist movement, uh, uh, um, the then, the 30s, uh, um, National Front, Front National, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, philosopher, thinker, uh, Charles Morat, who was an atheist, was tremendously influenced by Comte because he too wanted a, um, uh, this was nationalist, anti-Semitic, anti-gay, anti-Roma, anti-everything kind of movement. He wanted something like um, uh, uh, um, Comte's uh, uh, society, his ordered hierarchical society, but unlike Comte, he thought the old religions were better suited to human beings than something like the religion of humanity. So he actually, though he was an atheist, he was a big supporter of established churches. So it had an enormous, so he's in some ways, I think, a rather profound thinker, more so than the so-called new atheists like Dawkins and Dennett and others, because he understood that the need for a religion, something like a religion, something like a coherent story of the place in the world of humanity, of human history, and something like a need for an object even of worship went with being human. It would never go away. Um, so they needed a religion, so he invented one. Uh, sadly, it even had a Virgin Mary, which was a woman, a married woman he fell in love with, uh, who died before they could ever uh, consummate their love. And he set up her um, grave as an, uh, an object of pilgrimage for his followers. So it went right down to the last details. Now, what's the point of that? Well, for him, uh, atheist values were a kind of surrogate version or a, 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 an, an emptied out version of Christian values. All human beings were entitled to love or compassion or concern. Altruism was the essence of morality. Compare that with the morality preached by the most widely read atheist in the world. Can any of you guess who that is? The most widely read atheist in the world. Well, it's not Nietzsche and it's not Marx. It's Ayn Rand. You all know who Ayn Rand is. I never got the chance to meet her, sadly, though I did meet, when I lived in America in the 80s, I did meet many of her disciples. Um, and uh, she uh, is the only 20th century atheist, I think, to have had an impact on politics. After, at least in the second, after the, at least after the Second World War, atheists think atheists, right? And her books have sold in millions and millions and millions. She's a hugely influential figure. Couldn't call her really a philosopher, but she's a, uh, an inventive and colorful writer. Now, what does she say atheist values are? Egoism. Egoism. She says the, 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 the true atheist considers himself or herself uh, uh, solely from the standpoint of their own individual rational interests. If you're an atheist, you'll be a rational egoist. You won't care about other people unless they serve your goals. You won't attack them, you won't exploit them, but you won't care about them particularly because what you're concerned about is your own well-being and your own flourishing. So any morality, Christianity for example, or any political system which uh, depends upon altruism is evil. Now you can see, you might say, well, these are extremes, but these are not just two different moralities. They're opposed to each other. They're completely incompatible with each other, which is a very interesting feature of modern atheism, uh, that it has this uh, incompatibility. By the way, there is a, her history is interesting here, and uh, she was Russian originally and fled Russia a few years after the Russian, the Bolshevik Revolution, and she published a novel, her first novel, called We the Living, in which a heroine based clearly on herself has a Bolshevik lover. And uh, I was very interested to 
managed to get hold of, we consulted a copy of the first edition of this because uh, in a library in California originally, because it was impossible to buy that except for a, a first edition because she'd gotten rid of certain passages in subsequent editions. And the passages she'd gotten rid of, which she said were irrelevant, they were minor, they were of no importance, they were very important and very interesting. Because they showed that like many people at the time in Russia, like almost every literary per, literate person in Russia at the time, 1890 up to about 1920, she was deeply influenced by Nietzsche, or a rather vulgar interpretation of Nietzsche anyway. So she has one particularly vivid conversation between herself, with a different name, and a Bolshevik lover in which she says, you know, I detest your ideals. I abhor your ideals. For me, humanity is just there to be trampled on and ignored, except when there are, there are exceptional superior individuals. I loathe equality, but I love your methods. Torture, murder, enslavement. So she had this kind of, if you like, elitist view from day one, but she took that out of the first edition of her novel, because she, perhaps because she thought, maybe rightly, it wouldn't go down too well in America. It didn't fit into a, with, a, with a common American narrative in which anybody could make good in the world if they just uh, behaved rightly and had some kind of talents. But, so that's kind of one example. What are, what are the others? Are atheists necessarily committed to human equality? Definitely not, because one of the big uh, um, uh, atheist movements in, towards the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th century in Europe, was something called monism, capital M, monism. It was uh, a religion of science explicitly described like that by its founder Ernst Haeckel, who was called the Darwin of uh, Germany, the German Darwin. And he wanted to establish a religion, had thousands of, con mainly among intellectuals and professional workers and engineers, scientists and so on. Uh, was uh, a, a, a religion of science in which, and remember, this is important, 1890, 1910, uh, what the science, as he interpreted, it's not actually in Darwin, I don't think at all, but said was that the human animal is organized into a racial hierarchy. That was the Heichel view, with, of course, white Europeans at the top and all the rest of humankind. Uh, further down, and this was natural, these hierarchies, they, he said. He was also very strongly opposed to Christianity and to Judaism, he was quite notably anti-Semitic, and one of, his, one of his goals in spreading this religion was to eliminate the Christian and Jewish elements in European culture. Voltaire, by the way, the great Enlightenment philosopher, held the same view, had the same, the same kind of goal. So the interesting thing there is you could say, well, surely no one took that seriously. Well, one of his a most famous book, the Riddle, of the, the Riddle of the Universe, was published in Britain by the Rationalist Press Association, which also published H.G. Wells about 1905, published Julian Huxley. And Julian Huxley, a uh, very famous figure uh, in British thinking in the 30s, until really the late 30s, when Nazism was rising, um, or had risen, um, uh, held not dissimilar views. If you read what Huxley also published in this Rationalist Press Association, wrote about biology. He says Africans, he means black Africans, are inferior by nature. I can go, they, they don't, etc. He fills that out with various insulting uh, descriptions. And then suddenly, around about 1936, he changes it to. Now, what had happened between 1932 and 1936? Scientifically, nothing. There hadn't been some brand new discovery in science. What had happened was the rise of Nazism which was a threat to um, any kind of civilized values in Europe. So we didn't hear any more of that from Huxley, though after the war, he was still talking somewhat on and off about eugenics, which was another feature of atheism at this time, because if you, if you think that human uh, life can be improved by science, one of the features you might start thinking about is can the rather uh, haphazard business of procreation and having children not be made more scientific. And if you do want to make it more scientific, which model of superiority? You say we want better people, we want to improve the species, we want to make uh, human beings better and better. What does that mean? Where do you get the values from that? Does that mean thinner and thinner? Does it mean uh, stronger and stronger? Cleverer and cleverer, measured by who or what, IQ? Uh, 
whiter and whiter, because of course many of these people were right up to really the 30s were uh, what we would now, I think, rightly call uh, uh, racists. Um, so here's another one. No human equality. Another example of, of atheism without these. Uh, no human equality, uh, but hierarchy instead. Um, with people who are further down the hierarchy counting um, less and less as you, as you go down. And this is actually, I think, is a feature of atheism, which many people have accused Christianity of and other monotheistic religions say, well, the values of these, of these religions are always the values of the time. They just say God sanctioned them. Well, I think there might be some truth in that, but there's also some truth in that with regard to atheism. Most atheists at any one time hold to the values of their time. So in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, they were almost universally in Western countries racist values. So they were all, they all colored in that way. H.G. Wells, a writer I admire in his fiction, his science fiction, I think it's absolutely wonderful. He wrote a book called Anticipations, which he published, if I remember right, a non-fiction book, 1902. And he says, what about the non-efficient peoples of the world? The non-efficient peoples of the world. Then he explicitly says, the yellow, the brown, and the black. What about them? He said, well, the world isn't a charity, they'll have to go. H.G. Wells. So, um, these ideas, these, these values, these were very common and they were promoted by atheists. In fact, although I'm not a Christian and I'm not, I think some of the few critics actually at that time, as at the time of slavery and before the time of slavery, the time when the conquistadors went to uh, 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 Latin America and destroyed some of the civilizations there, some of the few critics were actually religious because they held to a belief in the divinely ordained equality of human beings. They all had souls. Whereas among some of the atheists, uh, many of that time, the idea was what mattered is not having a soul. There was no soul. It was how clever you are, how intelligent you might be. Now, of course, there was no basis for this pseudoscience of intelligence, just as I think there's no basis for the present obsession, which is coming back now with IQ. Um, I say that partly because I've known many extraordinarily clever people who are also extremely stupid. Um, that's just an anecdotal point, but I, do, I think the, sign, the rigor of uh, IQ testing is a very disputable kind of issue. But that's another. So in other words, there's no connection between liberalism and, um, uh, and uh, uh, liberal values on the one hand, no deep connection and no historical connection between uh, um, atheism and uh, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, liberal liberal uh, uh, liberal values. So that should we're getting on to the next question I'm going to ask now, which is about morality itself. But ask yourself the question: those of you who are atheists or non-believers of some kind, where do your values come from? Are they the values that you've seen around you in your society, um, and you've imbibed them? Well, that's the way values are transmitted. And that's, in a way, the, the way it should be. We can't all, or we shouldn't even try to kind of invent our values out of nothing. We actually can't do it. Um, but what authority do they have? Can you, is there some reason for thinking that your values are the values of all of humankind? Is there some actual reason for thinking that, that secretly everyone wants to have the values that you have, even though publicly they might reject them? Might there not be, as the ancient polytheists thought different ways of life in the world. Some of them may be appalling, some of them may be deadly to us, so we'd have to fight them to the death, like the Nazis. Or uh, uh, are there just kind of many, or is there some one way of life waiting to be consummated, to be achieved? That, that history can be seen as a kind of process of convergence on this way of life. Now, I think that view, that humanistic view, is a version of a theistic view because um, it's the idea that humankind, human, the human species, humanity, is a kind of collective agent that does things. We, humanity, abolished serfdom. And we went on to abolish slavery. And we went on to, to emancipate women to some degree. Then we went on to emancipate gay people to some degree and so on. But actually, um, all of these things were good things, in my view, 
but they're not done by humanity because, empirically speaking, if you just rely on, your, on history, on your senses, on your observations, humanity doesn't do anything. It's not there. I mean, it's a species, it's an animal species like other species. Um, is, there a, is there a universal history of tigers? Tigers first colonized that part of Asia, but then they found that a bit constricting, so they decided to colonize Southeast Asia. No, there are just countless tigers, each doing different things, living their lives as best they can. And I don't think humans are that different from them. The idea that there is a collective agent, somehow humanity, realizing itself throughout history, uh, trying to achieve kind of shared goals throughout history, is a fiction, it's an illusion, and it comes from monotheism. It makes sense if you're a monotheist, because actually the best monotheists have said, yes, there is a providential plan for history, but we can't know it. It's mysterious, beyond our reason. That's a view I respect. I don't share it, but I respect it. Um, um, but there's also a view which I don't respect, which says, we've identified the logic of history, the pattern of history, where history is going, and if anybody stands in the way of that, they've got to be pushed out of the way. H.G. Wells, Stalin, Hitler. In other words, if there's some group which is non-efficient, no use, Russian peasants, Roman people, Jewish people, they've got to be sort of removed. In the name of what? In the name of what sort of plan of human development? Um, uh, I think there is no such plan. I think history has no such logic or goal or end, and many people find that a depressing view, but I find it a liberating view, because it means nobody can push anyone else around in order to achieve that plan, because there is no such plan. It's just fiction. It doesn't exist, it never existed, um, and, and there never will be one. What about morality itself? What is morality itself? We all think we know that. Let me give you a, a, an anecdotal, not anecdotal, historical rather, example of someone who is tormented by this question. Uh, a a semi-forgotten figure now, known by some philosophers but not by many other people, is the Victorian Cambridge philosopher Henry Sidgwick, one of the great um, 19th century minds. Better moral philosopher than most of those who are better philosopher in every way than most of those who are described as like John Stuart Mill, a brilliant man. And he sort of suffered, at least as much as a Cambridge fellow could suffer, uh, from his doubts. Where in those days, to be a fellow, you had to sign a, uh, a form, or swear to a form, saying that you accepted. I think, I'm not an Anglican, so I don't know, I think there are 29, or is it 39? 29? 39. You had to sign a thing say, of, that you agreed to all 39 articles. Of it. And to begin with, he did, but then he began to have doubts. You know, I can only manage 30. And so his friend said, well, forget about it, have another port. None of us can manage even that many. But, that does, but he was a man of intense integrity and conscience. And so he resigned. He quit. And he devoted the rest of his life to trying to formulate a morality which did not depend on Christianity. He didn't completely reject theism because he, said, he thought that part of theism was the idea that there was what he called the moral government of the universe that what happened to human beings wasn't just blind chance, blind necessity, utter injustice, chaos. There was something there. He had to hang on to that, he said. If he did, couldn't hang on to that, he really couldn't, uh, couldn't go on. Uh, he was re-elected to a position, I think a professorship, because he was such a great mind. He devoted the next 30 or 40 years to doing that, and one of the ways he devoted himself to it, I know this sounds very strange to us now, was by the study of psychical research. Do you know what that is? What's sometimes called spiritualism. And the reason he did that is that he said that unless there is some further life beyond the grave um, in which he assumed injustices could be corrected and seemingly chaotic and meaningless events were found to have meaning, then life was just a tale told by an idiot and he couldn't accept that. So he devoted 30 years of his life to this. Towards the end of his life he said to a friend, I've spent my entire life, remember he's a very honest man, did not surfing with this, and I'll tell you what I've found in the meeting, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. He then died. But before he died, <laughs> before he died, he left an envelope. This might sound strange, but very common in Victorian times, uh, in, which, in which the envelope contained 
messages, which should he survive in some posthumous way, would be communicated through a medium. So he left her. Died, nothing happened within the time, I think it was two or three years, so that was it. Except, this is a true story, except a few years later, some mediums in Cambridge who received alleged messages from beyond the grave by um, automatic writing, hand moves, like, began to receive messages from H. Sidgwick. H. Sidgwick, in quotes, communicated long philosophical scripts and descriptions of his condition after, the grave, after, after death. And then one of them, which I absolutely love, and then I'll get back to morality and the authority of morality, he says, well, here I am, spent my whole life looking for this, found nothing, but here I am, I know this life after death. I'm still here, I'm, I'm here, absolutely, I know it, I know it to be true. So it's just sort of amazing. He said, uh, there definitely is, I have the unalterable, correct, direct experience of being, my, uh, of being alive after bodily death, but there's only one thing. I'm as baffled as I was before. <laughs> And I sort of imagined him in some celestial Cambridge combination rooms, turning around and saying, how long have you been here? Said, right, 700 years, Earth time. He said, do you know what we're waiting for? No. So um, it's a true story. And th then he had an aphorism, and he said, very unaphoristic writer, so this didn't quite gel. Uh, uh, he said, and so I've concluded that the uh, mystery of death is not solved by dying just as the mystery of life is not solved by living. It's rather good, I thought. By the way, the explanation of how that could happen is that most of the mediums at that time were, doing the, were the spouses of Cambridge fellows who'd known Sidgwick. <laughs> so, um, now why is this relevant? Well, Sidgwick tried to find a non-theistic foundation for ethics, that's to say, one not resting on God. He tried because he thought science, he wanted scientific evidence of bodily, of the mind surviving. By the way, even if he'd found it, it would teach him nothing, because either he would have been baffled as before, or the next world could be as random and inco incomprehensible as the one before. I mean, it only works if you think that there is a God who actually sorts things out after, after the fact. If there were, which some spiritualists, psychos, psychosurists, thought there might be one or two or three or even four or five or six different worlds like people, that you got kept being born in, but they were all natural and chaotic. It, there'd be no evidence of any moral government of the universe, or what he sometimes called the eye of the universe, some kind of moral eye looking on, on, on human beings. But, so he failed in his attempt. He said in his great book, Foundations of Ethics, the first edition of which contains a reference to immortality, which he took out of all the uh, subsequent editions, he says, I've just found a contradiction at the bottom of ethics. And the contradiction was this, not between selfishness and general well-being, but between pursuing the general well-being and simply acting on your desires for the moment. Because he thought if you're really uh, a, a kind of skeptical thinker, you'll conclude that the human soul and the human self is just a bundle of continuities, a bundle of sensations. It doesn't really exist. So the real thing is, do you just act on the wishes of the moment, or do you concern yourself with the general well-being? And he found no reason. He couldn't resolve this. He called it an ultimate dualism, a contradiction, a black hole at the bottom of ethics. And he died without ever resolving that, though who knows now, there might be, I might find a, an envelope stuck into my hotel room and door from signed H. Sidgwick. But uh, um, uh, he died without it. Now, what does this mean? I think the idea, and this is one of the few areas where I share Nietzsche's view, I think he was with this talk of the Superman and all that kind of thing. I think that was a kind of hyperbolic type of humanism, but where, um, uh, where uh, um, um, it, was, it was essentially a type of atheism which, which is a type of self-deification where human beings individually or collectively try to become the God they no longer believe in or subscribe to. I think the idea that there is, I think values and morality become problematical if you're a consistent free-thinking atheist. Not in the sense that you can do anything you want, necessarily, but in the sense that at least there are many moralities in the world, atheist and religious, not just one. None of them is uniquely or specially human. Human history isn't tending to produce one set of values rather than another. They're fighting it out and it's very contingent. It could happen one way or the other. And the idea that there's a special, sort of, a special um, uh, realm of value 
more important than self-interest, more important than beauty, more important than pleasure, more important than etc. aesthetics. Um, I think it's a hangover from Christianity. So that in a way, a free thinker now should not be criticizing or attacking religion of the old kind. A free thinker now should be asking, questioning humanity, questioning what values we have, uh, how we arrive at them, and how if we end up having different values, I mean, we like this group, how we live together, if we want to live together. That's a kind of very important question too. Um, the notion that we can move from a kind of getting rid of God, just like a kind of fairy tale, leave it in the past, and most things stay the same, morality stays the same, mostly stays the same. Um, um, we still concern ourselves the way Christianity, at least taught, never practiced fully, with all human beings and maybe species beyond human beings, other animals. Uh, the idea that we shouldn't be selfish or that we should be selfish. All these ideas, I think, become open once we've really, if we really leave uh, uh, theism behind. And I just conclude by saying, I'm not saying that you should leave it behind. Maybe you should go back to it. It's up to each of you to you, you will have communities, you belong to different groups, churches, other secular, secular organizations, whether you can discuss it, but um, there's nothing obvious about what atheists' values are. And my own view is that the liberal values, of which I broadly myself believe or subscribe to, they're mostly inheritances from Judaism and Christianity, at least among us. Um, and they form a kind, they make up a kind of form of life, which I'm attached to in which people are tolerant, they don't trample on other people, they don't, uh, or if they do, they at least recognize that something wrong has been done. They don't do what uh, many have done in the 20th century, which is glory in their cruelty and rapacity and see it as a kind of sign of superior vitality. Um, uh, that's the form of life I like, but it's not a form of life which has any guaranteed position in the world. It could be gone in 50 years' time. Uh, um, and uh, I'll do what I can to keep it going, but there are no promises. Thank you.